See? Well, we are in Daniel, but it's in Daniel 5. I don't know why you said 4. We're done with 4. It's old news. We're talking about the handwriting on the wall from Daniel chapter 5 today. Handwriting on the wall. I've subtitled the message, When God Crashes the Party. Think about that for a bit. What does the handwriting on the wall really mean? You know, it's really an idiom that speaks of a foreboding pronouncement of judgment upon a course of action or upon an individual or upon a nation. And we utilize that phrase, that idiom, in many aspects of our life. Boy, hey. Did you get the handwriting on the wall? Don't miss the handwriting on the wall. I was thinking about it in the last week or so in the newspaper and just realizing how many times the handwriting on the wall is really there for us. For instance, headline on Thursday, April the 21st, man wounded in March is shot again. I don't know about you, but when I first saw that headline, first thing that entered in my mind was handwriting on the wall. How many times do you need to get shot? For you figure out probably this isn't, you know, the lifestyle that is all that conducive toward being a blessing in life. Maybe I need to find different friends, a different place to hang out, right? I hope that it registers for you. Uh, <laughs> that's what we call the handwriting on the wall. How many times have you got to get shot? before God gets your attention that maybe you ought to ch think about changing your lifestyle. Or how about this one? This is on Friday. Prince dies at 57. When God crashes the party, you can party like it's 1999 all you want. But uh, we don't know everything surrounding his death. But if it were overdose, and if that were related to why he had to make an emergency landing just a few days prior to be treated, that's handwriting on the wall. How many times have you got to go into that state before you recognize, you know what? Maybe this lifestyle is destroying me. Maybe this lifestyle is not what it was cracked up to be. Maybe you really can't party like it's 1999. What is the handwriting on the wall? We see it in the international, on the international scale, this idiom being used. Uh, unfortunately, not as prevalent today. Winston Churchill famously referred to it after the Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain came back acquiescing to Hitler's regime refusing to protect Czechoslovakia justifying his behavior because there would at least be peace in our time Winston Churchill stood up in the parliament and made the most damning indictment upon Chamberlain's sacrifice of Czechoslovakia to Hitler when he said, we have suffered a total and unmitigated defeat. The terrible words have for the time being pronounced upon the Western democracies that thou art weighed in the balance and found wanting. And only with a supreme recovery of moral health and mar martial vigor could Britain arise again and take our stand for freedom as in the olden times. Wow. And as he was known to do, he rallied the nation to wake up from their sleep 
to recognize the handwriting on the wall. Unfortunately, I wonder how many people in England today would even understand that speech. How many people in America, even in the church, would even get the illusion that you've been weighed in the balance and found wanting? What is this handwriting on the wall? Its origin is Daniel. Daniel chapter 5. Because God is speaking to us individually and as a nation when he challenges the handwriting on the wall. There, it is used in art as well. And uh, the uh, sound guys, I've lost signal, so the you know, Rembrandt hanging in the National Gallery, London, painted the handwriting on the wall in 1635. I wonder how many people look at that painting today and wonder, wonder what made Rembrandt think about it and not have a clue. Unfortunately, a lot of Daniel has been relegated to flannel board teaching. But it is a powerful revelation of God prophetically of what man is like and what man is becoming when he rejects God. Remember, we started in, in Daniel 3, and what I tried to lobby it for at that time is, to, is for all of us to see that Daniel 3, 4, 5, and 6, Daniel has not jettisoned the primary thrust God has given them, which is prophetic in nature. Unfortunately, too many, even in the church, do not grasp Daniel 3, 4, 5, and 6 as the, in the prophetic context of the book of Daniel. And therefore, we miss what God is trying to teach us, and we relegate it to flannel board teaching. You see, he is still prophetically speaking. And what Daniel is revealing before he gets back to Daniel 7 and we see, oh, okay, that last confederation, Roman confederation under the auspices of the Antichrist and what that is going to look like and morph into and what's going to happen when that stone made without hands strikes it and obliterates that statue. What God is now showing us in these four chapters is he is showing us what happens under the Gentile domination of this world. No longer under the uh, Israeli theocratic governorship. It is turned over to the Gentile world. But does the Gentile world make it better? Or do they make it worse? What, what we see in Daniel 3, 4, 5, and 6 is that the worldview, the world system, under Gentile rule, will first of all seek to promote a God of man. Humanism. Man is the pinnacle. Man is the captain of the ship. Man is the master of his fate. It is man that must be worshipped for man. It is all about man. And if anyone doesn't want to bow and worship man and man's genius and man's capabilities and man's prospects, then you know what? They're going to be thrown into the fire. Because it's all about the worship of man. But what we then read in Daniel 4 is that as this world promotes the worship of man, does man become better? Does man evolve or does he devolve? Is man really, in all of our intellectual abilities and our technological advances, is man advancing? Is man getting better? Uh, are, are we more uh, able to, better able to, to treat humanity with a sense of humanity? No. What we read in Daniel 4 is, guess what? You elevate man to deity, 
and you want to worship at the altar of man and man's genius and man's ability, you don't need God in the equation anymore to live life, guess what? You become more beastly in life. You don't become more humane. You don't become more uh, a kinder, gentler nation or world. That's why even in the last 100 years, how many, we can't even count the millions of people who have been slaughtered in this world. Why? Because man becomes more beastly, Daniel 4 communicates to us. And then in Daniel 5, what we, what we are now going to read that, that, quite frankly, it just chafes at this world. I mean, you want to get the world irate? You get them to Daniel 5. Because in Daniel 5, God says, you know that world under, under Gentile rule, the, the world system, the world's philosophy, the world, it, it, it's not only going to produce beast, more beastal behavior, but lastly, guess what? I'm going to judge it. And you want, you want to get the world really upset? Tell them that, guess what? We're not moving toward utopia. Just give man the ability and he'll figure it out and, and eventually he'll figure out how to make things better. But we don't need God and we can mock and scoff at the idea that somehow, some way, God's going to get the final word. God's going to finally judge this old world of ours and our rulership and how we've ruled and how we've treated each other. You see, this bankrupt system, God says in chapter 5 here, the handwriting's on the wall, I am going to crash this party. And if, that, if there's any, anything that brings derision to our world system with its worship of man, it is the idea that God should dare think of intervening and stepping into our world and think that he can set it right. As one uh, president uh, 20 some years ago famously said in his State of the Union, we made this mess, we'll figure it out. We certainly don't need God as the Im implicit idea behind it. So, one day God's going to crash the party, dear friend, and the world doesn't like that. Second Peter chapter 3 reveals that picture and that image in there. In, in Second Peter 3, Look at how the world scoffs at this idea. I mean, they, uh, it, it, it's more than just a resistant to it. I mean, they become insane. Know this first of all, that in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking. Why? Because they're, they're consumed by their own lust. We'll get into that in a minute. And they say, where's the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. You think God's going to step into this and do something? Come on. Everything's been the same way it's always been, and there have always been the prophets of doom. And, they, yeah, and I, yeah, I've heard it a million times before. Please, give me something more substantive than that. And so I don't have the time to quote it all, but you can jot it down and read it. He says it, it, it escapes their notice that God's already interjected himself into this world in judgment before, i.e., the day of Noah. But they, you know, they don't want to believe that. They want to discount that. So he concludes by saying, so, you know, while you're mocking God and saying, you know, look, uh, it's bad enough. Why, yeah, if God's going to do something, why didn't he do it? And he says, here's why. Because God is so patient. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness but is patient toward you, not wanting any, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. You know the reason why God hasn't uh, intervened and crashed this party already? I'll give you, the answer is not because God's saying, you know what, I'll give you another chance. Maybe y'all can figure this out. You know, maybe if I just give man time enough, he can do it. No, it's because God is God is wanting his church to continue to bring people in. Amen? He's wanting to continue. 
for us to fill this place with people that need to hear the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's the only reason why God hadn't crashed this party yet. So, dear friend, whether it's me personally, whether it's in the, in the newspapers day in and day out, or whether it's for us as a nation or for this world, there will come a day when God is going to crash the party. And what does it look like? First of all, dear friend, what does it look like? What, what does the party look like before God crashes it? Ah, good question. What, is the, what does it look like? If we can get that slide, what does it look like for the, for the party when, before God crashes it? Well, let's take a look at verses 1 through. I know, I got to tell you all, you can breathe easy. I was so foolish, I, I had planned to cover all chapter 5 today. And in the first service, I gave them the option at the end, they could stay an hour later. Or we could close, and they chose to close. So uh, we're not going to get uh, we're not going to get there, but we're going to get somewhere today. All right. Look at chapter five. I'm going to ask you to stand in honor of God and His holy word. Let's look at verses one through four. Belshazzar. That's not Belteshazzar, which was Daniel's name. All right. This, this is Belshazzar. Belshazzar. The king held a great feast for a thousand of his nobles. And he was drinking wine in the presence of the thousand. Now, you're thinking, is there some exaggeration going on here? I mean, a Babylonian hall with a thousand people in it uh, partying. Different archaeologically, we know that the Babylonian hall itself could fit the main portion of the White House in it. A thousand people with no problem. When Belshar tasted the wine, he gave orders to bring the gold and silver vessels which Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken out of the temple which was in Jerusalem. Are you kidding me? In order that the kings and his nobles and his wives and his concubines might drink from them. Then they brought the gold vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God, which was in Jerusalem, and the kings and his nobles and his wives and his concubines drank from them. They drank the wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Father, we thank you for your holy word today. We pray that you would open our eyes to understand what life is like when you crash the party. Lord, to help us see the handwriting on the wall so that today, Lord, we might make corrective steps and decisions in our own life. For your glory and for our good. As we ask it in the mighty name of Jesus and all God's people said, Amen. You may be seated. What the party looks like before God crashes it. Belshazzar is five kings removed from Nebuchadnezzar. But he took office only six years after Nebuchadnezzar's death. Nebuchadnezzar died in 562 B.C. And then there were four intervening kings in the midst, the last of which was the one who took over in 5. 56, six years later, which was uh, Nebadeus. Nebadeus. And Nebadeus' son, Belshazzar, became his co regent. He actually left Babylon and gave it to Belshazzar to rule this state nation of Babylon. So that's where, that's where Belshazzar emerged. But Belshazzar would have been very familiar even as a young man with Nebuchadnezzar, which is very important down the road here. He takes over in 556. You know what day it is right now of chapter 5? It is October the 12th, 539 B.C. We know the date. We know it for various reasons that uh, we will unfold in a minute. It is October the 12th, 539. So he's been ruling for about 15 years as a co-regent with his dad, Nabonidus. Now, Belshazzar 
over these years has come to epitomize a worldview which is committed to rejecting God, ruling without God, controlling without God. And so as a result, this, this world that God is going to judge. And, and he paints a picture so you will see what a world looks like before God intervenes. And here's what it looks like. See if it doesn't sound familiar. First of all, it is a, 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 a world that is filled with indulgence. Your lust is consuming you, and you're rotting from the inside out, but you can't control it. It, it, is, it is lust gone mad. You know, you're consu- the only thing that, that, that you're focused in is how you're going to satisfy the cravings of your life. That is the dominating, controlling influence of your life. Here in these four verses, he has a feast that is the microcosm of a world system that has been given over, as Romans 1 warns, to lust. And it's being consumed by it. He throws the wildest party imaginable. Nothing rivals it. It breaks all protocol. But you know what? We live in a world today that... You know, we talk about southern values and graces, and we long for those old days because we live in a world today, right, where we see that the changing of the guard, things that would once were protocol for certain behaviors and certain standards, now are, we've all jettisoned them. Men and their wives and their concubines never drank together in parties. Didn't happen. I mean, you you see the allusion to that with John the Baptist and and Herod. They they brought in Herodias to dance and the daughter to dance. Um, But she was not a part of the drinking party. That was just breaking protocol. It wasn't done. But, But this party is the party that ends all parties. It is one of absolute indulgence. It is lust completely out of control. In other words, what happens in life when you jettison God is that you ultimately come to a point, you can't, you can't morally restrain yourself anymore. There are no moral boundaries, no moral restraints. Does that sound familiar? You can't even tell which bathroom you're supposed to use anymore. Am I right? You you can't even make a moral evaluation about what bathroom you're supposed to use because you've been so consumed. Anything goes. And woe be anyone who doesn't go by the party line. It is a lifestyle of absolute indulgence. In America today, if you were to take all the pornographic covers printed every month, just one month, you can cover, you can build a highway from New York City to San Francisco. That's just in one month. My gracious. But that's life. When you jettison God, you don't restrain yourself. You get to the point where you have no restraints. And as Proverbs says, you can't tell right from wrong if your life depended on it. Well, it doesn't have that part, but you know. It says we call wrong right and right wrong. We don't know. We have no moral restraints and no moral boundaries. What does a party look like before God crashes it? It is totally consuming itself in lust. What else? Not only indulgence, but indifference. Whatever God said in the past is quite frankly antiquated and is totally irrelevant for my life today. You think I'm going to live by the moral restraints that God has, has placed upon me. You're living in a, another world, dear friend. Not going to happen to me. 
I'm going to call my own shots. I will be the shot. I will be the captain of my ship and the master of my own faith. There's a total indifference to the revelation of God already given. See, as, as, as Daniel actually tells Belshazzar later on in verse 22, he says, you, you knew, you remember what God did with Nebuchadnezzar. So the judgment is going to be even more, challenge, more, more direct because, quite frankly, you knew what God did. And you blew it off in total indifference. Nebuchadnezzar had received revelations from God of judgments to come and this Babylon being conquered by the, uh, uh, another empire. And, uh, and guess what? On October the 12th, 539 B.C., on this night of the party, there is the Medo-Persian Empire that is camped outside the walls of Babylon. But is Belshazzar concerned about that? He's totally indifferent. God doesn't know what he's talking about. You know what? God can say what he would like. This kingdom ain't nobody going to mess with. God can say what he likes. God can threaten all he wants, but it's just smoke. And Belshazzar is totally indifferent. It's sort of like he's saying, you know, listen, God can say what he wants, but God can't touch his kingdom. The Titanic. Not even God himself can sink this ship. We live in a world that becomes so self-absorbed and confident in its own abilities that it is totally indifferent to all the handwriting on the wall, all the signs of the crumbling underneath our feet. And we instead throw the party. You know what? We aren't concerned. Let's have a party. And so to show the nation how little he thought of the Medo-Persian Empire camped outside his gates, he throws the wildest party ever so the nation will be able to talk about it and laugh about, you think that little country's going to threaten us? Are you kidding me? Come on, what a joke. You think we're concerned about that? Rather than falling to our knees and, and responding and calling upon God, we don't need to do that. That's a, what a waste. That nation has no threat to us. Why, why is he so indifferent here? Why is his attitude so indifferent? See, he was confident that his, the, his kingdom could not be conquered and not even God himself could conquer it, whatever he wanted to say. Why? Because, quite frankly, they had the biggest guns, they had the most fortified city, that nothing militarily could touch them at all, and they knew it. You think, the, uh, you think the wall of China is, is spectacular? And it is because it's remain and it's over 1,300 miles long. That's pretty, pretty big. But you know the height of, of the wall of, of uh, China, uh, uh, the Great Wall of China at its height, is, its tallest is about 45 feet. The walls of Babylon at their small, smallest level were a little over 80 feet. At their height, are you ready for this? I know this is hard for us to believe since we are so advanced and we think we are just so, you know, so much greater than anybody has ever been. The height at its greatest was over 300 feet, the length of a football field. Almost half of what the Washington Monument would be. The width of the wall was over 80 feet. They could drive six chariots abreast so that militarily they could get anywhere uh, uh, to, 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 to fight any foe uh, anywhere, anytime, as quickly as possible because they could get so many. It was over 80 feet in width. Now, let me ask you, was there a weapon tree, battering ram or anything else that could ever possibly break through that type of wall? And the answer is, laugh. No. There hadn't been anything that could damage that wall. They weren't concerned. And you know what? Militarily, they had also built a secondary wall, an inner wall as well, that was not quite as big, but it was still rather large. 
They had no worries. So you know what? Medo-Persian can park on their, 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 uh, their doorstep and all they can do is say, let's, let's party like it's 1999. They weren't worried at all. The walls, oh, don't think of this tiny little wall around there. The walls were over 14 miles to the north, 14 miles to the south, 14 miles to the east, and 14 miles plus to the west. They were almost 60 miles around. Oh, yeah, but you know what they could do? They could starve them to death, right? They could just tighten the noose around, pull it, and eventually wait them out till they starved them to death, and then they'd conquer, right? No, I don't think so, because the Euphrates flowed underneath the walls. And because of their extensive gardens, historians, which is why we know the date here, historians Greek and Persian record for us that they had enough water and supplies to last for, oh, 20 years. You think Belshazzar was worried about Medo-Persia? You got another thing coming. He laughed at him. You know what? Not even God himself can do anything about it. I'm not worried, and I'm not worried about God. And so, it is complete indifference. And in fact, to show you how much I disdain God, how much I, I, I laugh at what the threats of, of God's judgments are going to be, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to pull out his vessels, and I'm going to drink I'm going, to drink, I'm going to throw the wildest party with those sacred vessels of God because you know who's in control? It ain't God. It's me. And so, you know what? That's what he does. He brings out the gold. Dear friend, that would be like, we're going to have communion. I think it's next week. We're going to have communion uh, next week. It would be like you taking that communion, one of you in the middle of the service next week. Don't you do this. When you're in the middle of the service next week, you take it and you just pour out that juice and then you pull out a bottle of whiskey, you pour it in there and say, let's toast to the devil. That's exactly what he did. He took the sacred vessels of the one true God and he said, let's pour. God ain't got nothing on us. God's not going to morally restrain us. God's not going to morally dictate anything to us. We are God. And he is nothing. And we will toast to the devil. It is irreverence, the third category. Irreverence. You ever notice that when man moves away from God, he becomes tolerant of everything except God? He becomes tolerant of every moral, li uh, uh, immoral lifestyle in the book. But he becomes totally intolerant of God or any moral restraints. And therefore, he has no compunction to look at the little sisters of the poor and say, you will provide contraceptives. You will provide abortive material. Bring out the temple vessels. Because we are in control, not God. The one thing we won't tolerate is God interfering with us and with our greatness. A society, individuals, a nation, when it decides to live without God, inevitably move in these directions of indulgent, consuming itself in its own lust, and total indifference to the revelation of God, and a total irre irreverence to Almighty God. We're going to party, and God can't do anything about it. But dear friend, let me close by saying this to you today. What does that party look like when God crashes it? See, what God is giving us here prophetically 
is a glimpse of what happens when all of a sudden God crashes the party. And what we see, and Jesus spoke about this prophetically in Matthew 24, verses 27 through, uh, 37 through 39, where he says, For the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah, which is what Peter alludes to as well, or references, not alludes to. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving, they were, you know, God wasn't on their list. They're going to do things their way and live life their way. Come hell or high water. Until the day that Noah entered the ark and they didn't understand. Until the flood came and took them all away. So will the coming of the Son of Man be. You see, whether you like it or not, one day God's going to end this party. There is a, there, it's almost as if God gives you a glimpse here that there's a point, that tipping point, when you, when you take that, that like Belshazzar is just a picture here, when you take that sacred that communion of God and, and, you, and you toast to the devil, it's as if God says, you know what? Heaven can't endure this any longer. And he crashes the party. There's a point that heaven says, I cannot endure this. I am patient, eternal, so eternally loving and patient. But there's a point when I cannot endure this any longer. And I'll tell you what happens when God crashes the party. You know what happens? Number one, the party ends quickly. You ever notice that? Even in your own life, I'm not talking about something immoral, just having a good time, some great things happen, and somebody gets injured, and all of a sudden, the whole atmosphere changes, right? I mean, all of a sudden, as soon as someone is laughing, joking, having a great time, all of a sudden, call 911, and life changes. The party ends quickly. Here we see in Daniel 5, notice verse 5 and 6. Suddenly the fingers of that man's hand emerged and began writing opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the back of the hand that did the writing. Then the king's face grew pale and his thoughts alarmed him and his hip joints went slack and his knees began knocking together. Woo! Big man isn't as big as he once was, is he? We think we're so big and bad and bold and brave. Until all of a sudden God crashes into our life. And we realize how weak and anemic we really are. Right? I don't know what the record is for the, for the fastest sobering up job ever in the history of the world. <laughs> but I think Belshazzar has it. Uh, he went from inebriated to knees knocking that had nothing to do with the con consumption of wine. It had to do with the revelation of God. God had taken his breath away and sobered him up just like that. It is a, it is a, it is a frightening thing when God has to sober you up. Because when God sobers you up, he does it quickly. But God can and will sober you, me, and even his nations up. And when he does so, he does so quickly. When 9-11 happened, we didn't have to announce anything. We had a place filled with people wanting to pray that evening. Because you know what? When God crashes the party, all of a sudden, your knees buckle. And you realize you're not as big and bad and bold and brave as you thought you were. And you're not as invincible as you thought you were. And all of a sudden, those lusts don't seem to, to be nearly as alluring as they once were. And your indifference to, to God and what God has said to you, all of a sudden now, it's like, what is God saying? What message do I need for my life? And, and God gets your attention in the most powerful and dramatic ways. And I tell you, the party 
ends abruptly. Not only that, but you start looking for real answers. You start looking for real answers. I'm going to close here, but let me just read five through nine, and I promise I'll close here. The king called aloud to bring in the conjurers, the Chaldeans, the anyone, give me an answer. And the king spoke and said to them, any man who can read the inscription and explain its interpretation to me, you'll be clothed with purple, you have a necklace of gold around your neck, you have authority over a third of the kingdom. Then all the king's wise men, they said, okay, give it to me. No, that's what, isn't it interesting? That's what they did in the past. That's what they did in chapter 2. They tried to bluff their way in chapter 2. They tried to bluff their way in chapter 4. Now they ain't bluffing. It's, it's like you can have it all. I, I, this is above my pay grade. I don't know it. And I'm not going to try and bluff my way. You need a man of God here. That's what the queen said. You need a man of God. Remember Daniel? He can, he can set you straight. These wise men, they're looking for real answers too. The only thing these wise men were concerned about was soiling themselves. Not giving an answer. That's what happens when God crashes the party. Dear friend, you start looking to the one who can only give you the answers to your life. The answers to why you're here, what you're here for. And all of a sudden, all those other things become what they truly are. Totally irrelevant to your life. And all that matters is what does God who is God and what is God saying to me? Dear friend, I'll close by saying this to you. It's simply this. God is going to crash the party someday. We'll look more at it next week. But what God wants out of your life today is he wants to be your party. Not, craft it, not have to crash it. He wants to be your party. He wants to be your consuming love not the idols of this world. You make God your party and you'll have all eternity to enjoy Him. But if you're going to live a life, listen to me, whether young or old today, if you're going to live a life where you are the one who is the master of your faith, the, the captain of your ship and the master of your faith, you don't need God to tell you how you're going to control your body, how you're going to live your life, what you're going to do with your life. You know, God can come along if he wants to. You don't really care, but you're the one that's going to call the shots. Let me tell you, God will crash your party. God will crash your party. So your chores here is as clear as night and day. You can neither let God be your party or he will crash it. Make God your party today. That's what his amazing grace is about. He doesn't care what you've done, where you've been. He's ready to forgive and restore you. It's time for you to let God be your God.